my name is Maddie Baggett, and today I am joined with none other than rock and roll pioneer David Sparrow. David, I want to thank you so much for coming. Oh, no today. problem. It's great to be here. Oh, we all thank you. It's, this is wonderful. All right, so you have a career that many rock and roll fans can only dream of. When did you when did you first find music? How did you start to love it? When I was uh, <laughs> when I was six years old, I recorded a song with the Cleveland Orchestra called 67 Santas. And uh, I did it at the old Cleveland recording where the James Gang and Grand Funk and all these other people made records. And um, it was like the coolest thing in the, world, in the world to me that here I was, you know, I got this orchestra behind me, you know? And, uh, and I just kind of fell in love with the process when I was six. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was like 12, I was really listening to everything on the radio and knew that that's what I wanted to do. I was going to become a disc jockey. Um, my dad had been a disc jockey in the 40s with uh, Bill Randall and some of the guys that you know first started rock and roll and all that. Um, it just seemed like a really cool way to do things. So when I was in high school, in, in I was in 10th grade, um, I was on a station called WXEM, which is 106 something now, you know. And uh, I did, um, it's kind of like your station, you know. I did, there was the Italian hour, and then there was the Polish hour, and then there was the this hour. Well, I had midnight until I didn't want to be there anymore, as long as I was gone by 6 a.m. doing, you know, underground radio. And I could play anything I wanted, and uh, it was during the time that my dad was producing the Upbeat Show, which was a national rock and roll show out of Cleveland. So I'd bring, you know, Jimmy Page over to do my radio show, because if he'd been on the show with the Yardbirds that day, or, you know, I'd bring over whoever, whoever I, you know, I thought would be cool to bring over, you know, and they'd come over to the station, and, you know, we'd just have a night of it, you know, and, uh, it was, uh, it really got into my blood, and then a station called WNCR, which was really the first of the, you know, real underground station 24-7, mm -hmm. started, and um, my dad had some contacts, and I went over there, and I pretended like I really knew what I was doing. I'd never run a board or anything at the other station, they had a guy running the board. And they said, cool, you're the morning guy, you start Monday. And it was like... I spent the whole weekend there watching everybody work, trying to figure out what all these dials were, you know? And you were really young, right? When did I you first start? I was 17, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did you ever feel pressure to... Nah, I no? was too dumb. <laughs> I mean, it was not a job. It it's was right, like, though. it's like I'm going to play music, you know? Mm -hmm. you know? And talking was no big deal. I was just going to, you know, I, it, was, it just came natural. And then... Um, we did WNCR for a year, and uh, me and a guy named Billy Bass and uh, Martin Perlick, we all left NCR on Friday and we started WNMS on Monday. And uh, that was the real deal. That was the real deal with radio. You, through radio, you've interviewed these phenomenal, just historical artists. Do you have a favorite interview you did? Wow. Um, well, the first interview I ever did was with Janis Joplin, and um, it, I can't even tell the story. <laughs> I was, <laughs> because because I thought because wow. things happened, or <laughs> because, because of things that happened. Oh, wow! Yeah. And uh, it was like, wow, this is I'm liking this job, you know. And uh, yeah, I think one of my favorite interviews was. Not necessarily with the biggest star that I've ever interviewed. It was a guy named Nicky Hopkins. Okay. Nicky was a keyboard player, and he was a session guy in, in the UK. And he played on all the records of The Who and The Kinks and Donovan, and then was uh, the keyboard player for the Rolling Stones on tour for a long time. Played in the Jefferson Airplane, the Jefferson Starship. He was on something like four or five hundred records that charted, which is amazing. So talking to him, um, and I was going to, you know, I did it as a favor 
for a guy at Columbia Records because he had finally had his own solo album. And uh, we became really good friends. I, he did four hours on my show. I, I, if I had a longer show, he would have stayed on. <laughs> we were just playing all this stuff that he'd played on, and it's like, really? And you know, he'd say, oh yeah, well I did this thing here, and you know, this, he'd talk about what the producer had asked for or whatever. He was so, he just opened my mind to the, what the studio possibilities were. And um, I ended up managing him years on. And uh, you know, dealing with the Stones for them, and he played in Stevie Nicks's band, and it was uh, it was kind of fun. He was a wonderful man. So let's switch. Um, you just mentioned uh, managing. So let's switch, switch from radio to managing. When did you decide to make that switch? I never did. I, you never I did. didn't. Um, Joe Walsh, who I've known since I was about 13 years old, he used to hang out at the radio station with me because he loves radio. Mm -hmm. He picks songs and. I'd let him read the news and stuff. <laughs> um, he said uh, that he was working on this record with this guy from Cleveland named Michael Stanley. And he was playing guitar and helping him write, and he was using his band to back up Michael. He said, you, you need to manage this guy so that eventually you'll become my manager. And I said, well, I don't know anything about managing. He goes, well, no, no, I'm going to bring you out to LA. You're going to follow my manager around, a guy named Ruby Azoff. And, and I followed him for about six or seven months. And he, he taught me two things, everything I needed to know and everything I didn't want to be, which was kind of a, a good thing. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't really have this vision of me being out in L.A. with, uh, you know, every shark in the world. Mm -hmm. And I figured, well, if I can do this out of Cleveland, I'll just kind of own it, you know. So that's what I did, and um, I had Michael, and he had introduced me to a guy named Bill Simzik, uh, who's that producer who you see on the back of all those albums of the Eagles and the Who and Seeger and Walsh and Stanley and all those guys that he produced. Um, he doesn't have a vowel in his name. And so I was managing him, as well as Michael, and there was a guy from Lorraine who had just started on this show called Saturday Night Live, and. He uh, had a character called Father Guido Sarducci. Okay. His name's Don Novello. He's from Lorraine. So I had this little stable already of these three guys. And, um, you know, everybody had a major label. We're all with major labels and major touring companies. And Michael's opening for Aerosmith. And he's opening for the Eagles. And he's opening for so many different Loggins and Messina. You know, we used to tour 250 days a year. So um, I did that up until the late 70s, and then I just got burned out. Um, the problem with rock and roll at that period was cocaine was really not illegal as a drug, you know. I don't remember what year that all changed, but it wasn't. It was legal if you had a prescription, and you know, of course in rock and roll, you can get anything you want. and. Um, you know, drugs and alcohol started to play into it, and I was in a really bad cycle. And, um, and I wasn't doing a good job, and I was pretty sure I was going to die, and eh, oh well, I was here, you know. And uh, I just had a weird incident one day that I left my car running at a red light and got out to go talk to a friend of mine, forgot the car was there, left. Next morning, I think my car is stolen. Call the police. They said, oh no, we found it. The keys were in it. It was running. I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have left keys in my car. And said somebody must have taken it and found the keys and made up this whole thing and said, that's it. And uh, so now I'm like 36 years clean and sober. Um, but realized I couldn't go back to what I was doing because it was so easy. You know, you shake hands with the promoter and there's, you know, two grams sitting there in your hand. Um, and somehow just through, I've had this life where things just like, oh, what's that in my lap? Oh, you know, it's a, I ended up working for Columbia Pictures for like 13 years. <laughs> um, and worked on pictures like Ghostbusters and uh, 
Karate Kid and Gandhi and Tutsi and all these. I mean, it was during their heyday. And, uh, so I just kept doing that. And then one day while I was doing that, I got the call from Walsh. And he said, are you ready? And I said, for what? And he goes, I told you I was going to call again. And I said, seriously? And he so I quit Columbia Pictures that day and went out to California. Hung with Joe for an hour, and next thing I knew I was his manager, and he needed a tour to start in three months, and he was just finishing the record, and I'm like, oh, you just, <laughs> now you've hit the big time. <laughs> Joe Walsh, a phenomenal performer, breathtaking. What is your favorite, do you have a favorite song to watch him perform? Um, I think life's been good, and, and for two reasons. One, I remember when he was writing the song, uh, and most people think it's a funny song, and it really is a very, very sad song. I mean, it's about this guy that has everything but doesn't have a second to enjoy it. You know, I, he, he's pulled into parties and dropped off in his room, and he's got this mansion he's never seen, and he's got accountants paying all the bills. He doesn't even know what the bills are. And, you know, it's a, it's. Um, it was a reality check song for him. And I see, when he performs that, I see the Joe that wrote that song and knowing where he was at the time, even though, you know, inside every clown is a very sad person and he's, the, he's that person. Now, working, you mentioned earlier that Joe Walsh is a free spirit. Did you ever find it difficult to manage somebody like that? 24-7. <laughs> um, before Joe got sober, which was in the early 90s, um, if my phone rang at night, I was afraid it was that call. Because, you know, he was, he, he lived on the edge. You know, he just, that's, that's where he was the most comfortable and tilting over, like, towards the, you know, towards the ground. That's where he lived. And, um, yeah, it was, it was tough, but you know what? It, as most musicians, it all came down to the music. And I would notice that as tours would end, and we did lots of tours together, um, and I did tours that Joe was on where, like, Michael Stanley Band Open, and I would see the same Joe. The further into the tour it got, the closer to the end, the more volatile he would get. And I, it, it, it hit me one time. We were doing the Joe Walsh and Glenn Fry tour right before everything happened with the Eagles again. And we had finished the tour, we were on uh, Long Island. And that night, Joe had like really destroyed his dressing room, nothing was right screaming at everybody, and it was the last night of the tour. And the next morning, I'm, I'm getting ready to leave, and he's leaving, and we're in the lobby, and I saw this guy that was, he wasn't a rock star, he wasn't a guitar player, he was a lost guy. And everybody's there with their families, you know, Every, all, all the families usually come to the last show, you know. And Joe was there by himself, and I thought, He's got nowhere to go. This is, and he, as he gets closer and closer to nowhere to go, that's when he starts freaking out. As a manager and a friend, what was that like for you? Once I figured it out, it made a whole lot more sense. And it, I knew I needed to keep him busy when he wasn't working. So that's what I, I got him involved in like getting on the Drew Carey show where he was a semi-regular for a couple seasons, or he had done a couple other TV shows. I got some film properties that he was looking at, or, you know, something he could do soundtrack work for. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it just changed everything. So that whole lifestyle and working with somebody like Joe Walsh is, could be very detrimental. Why did you stick around? You could have just walked. Because you're there. <laughs> There's something, and it's something I'll never forget. Eagles were playing um, Rose Bowl, 
We had 107, 108,000 people in there. And as we always, everybody always walked to the stage together. You know? And, you know, we're walking up, and we've been on this tour for a year and a half already, so, you know, <clears throat> not really a big deal. But as we get closer and closer, the, the audience was so loud. And all it was was when the stage went dark. Mm -hmm. And they're out of control. And Joe stops. And he said, some of that's for you, you know. And um, I mean, not that I didn't know that, but to hear it, yeah, that's why you stick around. It isn't for the 22 hours that you're working your ass off mm -hmm. or sitting in a hotel room or traveling. Mm -hmm. It's for those two hours. Or, Three in the case of Eagles, you know, mm -hmm. that's what it's for. It's just, boy, watching everybody at the top of their game, just kicking ass. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. And whether it was, you know, with, with Dickie Betts from the Allman Brothers or Richie Fure from Buffalo Springfield, I, I've been so fortunate that these guys have, you know, come into my life in certain ways mm -hmm. that I've, you know, I've worked with all of these Hall of Famers and and uh, legends, you know, so it's kind of, I'm the luckiest guy in the world, you know. Um, the way these things have happened, like with Dickie Betts, I never met Dickie in my life. And uh, I was working at the Rock Hall and I was leaving the Rock Hall, I decided to go back into management, I got really, I, I just kind of got bored, you know, I was in one place for the whole, long time. I was producing a TV show called Live at the Rock Hall for MTV, which I really enjoyed doing, but then it stopped. And then it was like, I don't really need to be here anymore, you know? And uh, so I put together a, a, a goodbye party for myself that was a fundraiser for the Rock Hall. And I had Peter Frampton, and uh, I, I called up like some of my good friends and mm -hmm. said, hey, come on, do this for me, yeah. you know? It's a fundraiser for the Rock Hall. Mm -hmm. And we were supposed to have Greg Allman, and Greg got sick, and Dickie showed up. And uh, Dickie knew who I was from other people that we both knew. And mm -hmm. he said, well, you know, I'm looking for a manager. And I said, really? Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, why don't you come and see me next week when you're done here, and we'll get it together. Well, we've been working for 14 years together now. Mm -hmm. um, Cat Stevens goes by Yusuf right now. I had known in the early 70s when I was a disc jockey, played his music, and I was doing a, a, a DVD with Dickie Betts that we actually shot at the Rock Hall. And I was calling the president of the company that was doing the DVD. And unbeknownst to me, when the secretary says, you know, David Spiro, line three, um, Cat is in this guy's office, and he says, David Spiro from Cleveland? Now, Cat had left the business for 31 years. Nobody heard a word from him. I never knew he was back in the business. And uh, next thing I know, he'd gotten my phone number from this guy. And he, I'm at home and he calls and goes, Dave? And I, yeah. He says, uh, Yusuf, you knew me as Cat Stevens. And I said, oh my God. <laughs> you know, I thought you were like gone or something. <laughs> yeah, I was. Well, I wasn't, but I was. And, and uh, the next afternoon, I flew to New York, and next thing I knew, I'm his manager. Right? These, these circles, mm -hmm. I've just lived this life of circles. I don't know how to explain it. At, was there any moment in this life of circles where you took a step back and you said to yourself, this is it, I've made it? Or are you just constantly riding that circle? That, that's interesting. I'm, I'm afraid to do that. Um, I'm in the midst of writing a book. Okay. Uh, Michael Heaton, who writes for The Plain Dealer and has written other people's books, mm -hmm. came to me and said, you know, I think it's time you, you know, you've got all these stories, we should get them down. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so we are. And I think when I read that book, <laughs> I'll look at that and go, wow, you know, that guy did okay. Yeah. It still never seems to be me. Um, there's a record I did with Yusuf, uh, I don't know, a year and a half ago, and we were doing part of it down in Nashville, and uh, we just finished something, and he said, 
you know who would be perfect to do the harmony on this? And I said, who? He said, Paul McCartney. And I said, well, do you know him? He goes, no, I, I met him on stage once in like 1971. We sang All You Need Is Love together from opposite side of the stage, and we did this. He said, that's, the only, that's about the closest I ever got to him. I said, well, you know, I, I dealt with uh, him through the Rock Hall on a couple of things, and, uh, and I'd met him and knew him from upbeat days, but he wouldn't know who I was to, you know, say anything. And so I called his office and I said, look, uh, you know, Yusuf is looking to see if Paul would be interested in doing this with him. And I left uh, Yusuf's cell phone number and I said, listen, if he's going to call him, please call me first and let me know and here's my number. So. It's five o'clock in the morning down in Nashville. My phone rings. I look. It says, you know, private or something. And it's like I never answer those. And then I start thinking, well, I'm out of town. What if somebody's in the hospital? You know, what yeah. So I answer it, and uh, I hear a voice go, uh, "Yusuf." And I said, "No, it's David." Oh, Dave, it's Paul McCartney. I get to sing with him, eh? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> excuse me, you know, comb my hair. You know? <laughs> Mouthwash, <laughs> and I said, uh, "Oh, I thought you were going to be calling him." You know, and I didn't even know it was. And he says, uh, "Well, I thought this was—I got the numbers mixed up and all this because they were both U.S. numbers." And uh, he says, uh, "Well, when when does he want to do it?" And I said, "Well, it's kind of up to your schedule." He said, "Well, when do you guys go back to the U.K.?" I said, "Wednesday," and he said, "Oh, I get back Tuesday night." How about Thursday, 11 a.m., and, and there's a studio, you know, he tells me the studio, it's right down the street from his office. Uh, meet you there, let's call it 11. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Am I sleeping still, yeah? Mm -hmm. And so I said, do me a favor, please call Yusuf, call the other number, tell him to act, even though it's 5 o'clock in the morning. So I'm just waiting, and about five minutes go by. There's a knock on my door, and there's Yusuf in his bathrobe, and he's like, you'll never guess who called. And I said, I said, oh man, I just had this dream, but Paul McCartney called you, and he said to be at the studio at 11 next Thursday. Uh, he goes, oh my God, that's what just happened. <laughs> and I, I had to tell him the truth, you know, he's a little closer up there than I am. Mm -hmm. So I think, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I called here too. I said, so... Next thing I know, not even a week later, I'm in the studio with Paul McCartney, and I'm saying, you know, blah blah blah, mm -hmm. and this is kind of what we're looking for because Yusuf is just intimidated, so intimidated yeah. by him. He's like, even though Paul did everything he could to make everybody feel at ease, he, he walked in and he had an acoustic guitar, and Yusuf said to him, "Is that the guitar? Is that the old Martin used to use, or is that the reissue?" And mm -hmm. Paul says, "Oh, this one? No, no, no. This one did." Um, I've just seen a face I can't forget. Oh, wow. oh, please. And and next thing he's saying to Yusuf, well, on, on Moonshadow, you've got that weird cue change. Show that to me. And the two of them are going back and forth for about 45 minutes playing their songs. It's me and the engineer. Mm -hmm. And we're just sitting there going. <laughs> and I, I managed to take some pictures. I don't know why I didn't think to just set the camera down and record it. Uh -huh. I'm so stupid. <laughs> and I don't like to intrude, but yeah. And then when Paul's in the studio, I call my older brother and I said, "I think I'm in London, <laughs> and I think I'm in the studio with Paul McCartney. And what the hell am I doing here? I am so out of my league." I thought. And my brother says, "But you're in the studio with Cat Stevens too." Man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, but." Yeah, I guess that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> was it Abbey Road Studios? No, we did it. I, I've worked at Abbey Road. Um, Yusuf did some stuff there. And we did the Live from Abbey Road TV show, mm -hmm. which was kind of cool. And uh, first time I was at Abbey Road, an engineer was showing me around. And, and uh, we were sitting in the studio uh, in a control room. And all of a sudden, it just was like, went ice cold and was really shaky. And I said, and the guy looked at me and says, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I don't know. I don't feel well. He says, well, you know, that's where, right where Paul was sitting when he did Bluebird on that couch where you're sitting right now. And I, I said, this is it? He goes, 
Yeah, you can feel it. And I did. I didn't even know. It just freaked me out. Oh, wow. So, between everything you've done, you've gained a lot of artifacts. And your house has been quoted as being a mini Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> but do you have a favorite artifact, one that stands out amongst the others? Yeah. I, well, I've, got, I've got a guitar that Paul signed for me that is hanging on the wall with a frame that has three pictures as he's signing it. And you can see uh, he wrote Rock and Roll is here to stay, you know, Paul McCartney. So you see in the first picture, Rock and Roll, and you know, is here to stay. Mm -hmm. And then the last one finally shows up with the signature, and then there's the guitar sitting right there. But I also have um, a drum head, a Beatle drum head that Ringo gave me. That's on um, one of the 1964 um, uh, bass drums. Mm -hmm. it wasn't his, but he gave it to me. The, the drum was, it, it's like just one that he had. It wasn't like an actual one that he used. But the drum head was from the second Ed Sullivan show. And then I also have the um, original, uh, it's the first print that Cat Stevens did of T for the Tillerman, because he drew that cover. And then back in the radio days, he had given me that. And those things, I mean, I have a lot of gold and platinum records that, you know, were like, you know, you know, I don't deserve those. I didn't record those records. I mean, it's fun. I was a part of them in, in lots of ways. Um, my favorite of those probably is Ziggy Stardust, because at MMS we were the first station in kind of the world to expose David Bowie to people. So uh, David had given me a gold record for that. So through everything, through all of your stories, through everything you've, you've experienced, how are you able to stay so humble? Because it's not, none of it's about me. You know, it's like I have a good phone book, <laughs> you know? But it isn't, none of it's, you know, I can't say, oh, well, this is me, this is me, this is me, this is me. It's, um, I've just been really fortunate to, you know, be with my heroes. Music, music was all that mattered to me growing up. Um, I worked on the 1974 uh, four-way street, tour. well, it became four-way street after the fact, but the CSNY tour. And um, I was going to my room one night, and you know, we stayed pretty high on that tour. Um, and I was walking past Neil's room, and he used to have this Fender Rhodes piano in his room, and the door was kind of open. And he was playing something from after the gold rush. I just kind of kicked the door open. I said, you know, that album got me through my junior year in high school. Knowing I could go home and listen to that for hours, yeah. it got me through. And uh, he's like, well, sit on the bed, Dave, you know? Mm -hmm. And we're both sitting there, still out of our minds, you know? <laughs> Southern man, when... I mean, you know. It's, it's crazy that I've, I've gotten to live these moments. And there's so many times it's like, where's that camera? Why isn't that camera following me, you know? But um, I've had these artists, you know, Cat Stevens sit in my living room and play T for the Tillerman, the whole album on his guitar, trying to remember if he can do all the songs off of it. And just, you know, try and do everything I can not to start crying, you know? Because to me, that was such a, a pivotal album in my life. And I don't know, maybe it's like, uh, you know, the Tom Hanks character. <laughs> you know, he, he's, he's, he's the tennis player in China, and he's <laughs> hanging with presidents, and he's like living this life uh, that the camera actually followed him on. But um, uh, why can't I think of the name? Forrest Gump. Yeah. Yeah, you know, or Zelig with, with Woody Allen, you know. I, I'm actually living that life. I don't know why. I don't understand it. I, I, I don't think I could do anything else. I, I wouldn't know what to do. I, you know, I, um, I never went to college. I never uh, finished high school. You know, I was my senior year. I'm the morning guy on WMMS. You know, it's like, well, why did I need to stay in school? Mm -hmm. I knew what I wanted to do. I regret that. To this day, I would have liked to at least had the college experience. I, 
I kind of got it being on tour and being on so many college campuses, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, with with bands. But um, yeah, I, I, you know, I've missed a lot of that stuff. It's it's a regret. So I have one more question for you. Is there any moment that you can just look back and be, is that a career highlight? Do you have a career highlight? Well, being in the studio with McCartney, that to me was, as many times as my brother and I sat in our bedrooms with our hair combed down over our foreheads singing Beatles songs at the top of our lungs, um, you know, I don't, I don't know how to, I don't know what could top that, I don't know, you know, or, you know, I was involved when Buffalo Springfield reformed a couple of years ago with Richie Fure and Neil Young and Stephen Stills, and here we are at Bonnaroo in front of 97,000 people, and I'm standing on the stage looking out there. I mean, that, you know, that was amazing, I, you know, doing the Hell Freezes Over tour, doing Ringo Starr tours. Um, I remember I was walking down a street in New York once with a friend of mine. We're just walking, and Ringo's coming towards us. And I'm thinking, I mean, I know I know him. I know he knows me. But, you know, this is like real life now. And he goes, hey, Dave, what are you doing? You know, and my friend is like, oh, my God. <laughs> he really knows me. And it's like, in the end, they're all just people. And they all have heartache, and they all have great times and you know they go back to their family lives those that have families and uh, go to the grocery store and cut their lawn and well probably Paul, not Paul McCartney but, uh, <laughs> but everybody else you know <laughs> to me there's like Paul everybody else <laughs> and it's always it's always been that way yeah it's um, it, I mean a lot that. of people like that with Neil Young but I've known Neil for so long it's mm -hmm. kind of hard and even with like Eagles or, or the Zeppelin guys, they all knew really well mm -hmm. before they hit. And it's hard to look and think, wow, that, that's, they're really something. Mm -hmm. It isn't. It's just Joe and Glenn and Don and <laughs> Timothy. I mean, you know, it's, I mean it's, it's like these are legends and icons to a lot of people mm -hmm. and to me. But they're also my friends. Yeah. You know, they're people that I get Christmas cards from and send Christmas mm -hmm. cards to. They're, you know, part of their families and, and, you know, go to the important birthdays and things like that. It's, um, I don't know. I, I don't live in reality, so it's hard for me to really give you an answer to that. Wonderful. Well, David, I want to thank you so much for stopping by. All of your stories were fantastic. Uh, It'll make a good book, I think. I can't wait for that release, you said October? Hopefully, yeah. We'll yeah. We're all waiting anxiously for that if one. If you're reading this, I must be dead. Yes. Oh, okay, real quick, tell us the story about how you got that name. Um, on the Eagles tour, on Hell Freeze is Over, everybody had to sign a non-disclaimer, mm -hmm. except for me, because I didn't work for the Eagles, I was Joe Walsh's manager. So, throughout the whole tour, Henley and Fry, they don't get along. Glenn would call me up or come to my room and he would say, oh, you know what Henley did today, you know, and I'd be writing all this stuff down, kept a diary of it. And then one night, we were flying from Pittsburgh to uh, Las Vegas. We we're going to open up the Hard Rock Hotel out there. Mm -hmm. He gave us way too much money to play for like 35 minutes. It was ridiculous. <laughs> and we had our own plane and we we're flying out there and Glenn comes over to me and he says, I got it. And I'm like, well, what? The title for your book. What is it? And he hands me his little piece of paper and says, if you're reading this, I must be dead. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. No We're all anxiously Thanks. waiting for that. For Matt, for CO420, I'm Maddie Baggett. Thank you. <laughs>